What I've begun to recognize for our church and for our body is God is opening a divine door. It's a door of destiny. And he's inviting all of us to not just step in, but to step through that door. It reminds me of a vision that Suzanne had a couple of years ago about a door that was open and, and, and some people were choosing to go all the way through and other people were, um, were hesitant. And because of that, they were getting stuck on the other side because there was a window of opportunity. And, and, and while there's grace and there's mercy and second chances and third chances and fourth chances, and how many of you are thankful that if a righteous man falls, in t- falls seven times and gets back up, there's hope for all of us, amen? At the same time, there's often windows of invitation and opportunity where God is desiring to do a certain thing in a certain place at a certain time. And he gives an invitation to a certain group of people. And in that window of invitation, there's opportunity to step forward. But, but because the harvest demands it, because the time and season that we're in demands that ultimately somebody's gonna pick up the call that God asks, that if, the, if, if that certain people don't walk through at a certain time in a certain place, God will give the invitation to another people. How many of you know that? And it's not to exclude one and to include the other. It's just saying that somebody needs to lead the way. Somebody needs to blaze a trail. Someone needs to pioneer. Someone needs to forerun. Amen? And I, be, I, believe, that, I believe that that's a, a big part of the call on this house is that we are, a, we are a forerunning church. I believe that we're not just a prophetic church, but I believe that we are a pioneering church. We're an apostolic prophetic body. Amen? And God is, I believe, not just leading us into a new place, but I believe that there's, there's things that he's wanting to awaken in the nation and in his church. But first, he's looking for a people who say, Lord, if, if, you're, if your eyes are searching to and fro, looking for hearts that are completely yours, look no further, here am I. Amen. David said in Psalm 119, he said, how can a young man keep his way clean? And, and, and he said, by taking heed according to your word. In other words, not just hearing the word, but becoming a doer of the word. Amen. James said, let us not just, let us not just hear the word, but let's be a, a doer of the word. Verse 11, Psalm 119, David said, I've hidden your word in my heart. I have feasted on your word that I would not sin against you, that I would not find myself making decisions based out of fear, fear of loss, uh, you know, uh, just fear of death, but I would make decisions based out of how I feel you leading me. In Psalm 16, he said, daily I set the Lord before me. Because you're at my right hand, I'll never be moved, Amen. And I want to tell you, listen, how you see what you see often determines where you go. And that's why it's so important to give the word a priority in our life. How many of you know that? And, I, I, and I've just, as, as I've been meeting with our team and our staff this week, and we've been praying and, and feeling a call on this house and even on our leadership to, to come higher and to go deeper, to come higher and to go deeper, to raise a standard and to return to the word. I believe that God is doing some things in our church where it's not just remembering past prophetic words, but it's actually returning to the word. Because it says in in Romans chapter 12, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, you know, to, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice. So this is your reasonable act of service. The Passion Translation there actually says, this is your worship. And then he goes on in verse two to say, to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed, say transformed, in the renewing of your mind. And see, transformation in the heart of the believer happens through the word and through the spirit. In fact, Josh, could you do me a favor? Could you put Romans 12, one and two in the Passion Translation on the screen? I want us to look at this as a preface to where we're gonna go. I've got a brief word for you this morning about uh, revival reborn and some of how I believe God is wanting us to posture our hearts in his house for what he not only desires to do here, but also in our city. Romans chapter 12, verse one in the Passion Translation, beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God, to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart for this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Verse two, stop imitating the ideals ideals and opinions of the culture around you. That's what Paul was talking about when he said, do not be conformed to the world. Don't be shaped by your surroundings but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. 
This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. And what I believe that, that we've been given, not just through the word, but also through our will. How many of you know it is, a, it is an act of your will to spend time in the word? Amen. The, 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 the Jesus, when he introduced the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he described him as helper, not doer. He comes alongside, he helps. He's also the teacher. He te- in John 14, 26, he says, when he, the helper has come, he will teach you all things. Hallelujah. He will teach you all things and he will bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. And I wanna tell you, we, we should never spend more time focused on the world than we do focused in his word. Amen. Even with our, our, our staff and our team, I said, guys, I never want us to spend more time on the work of the ministry than we do in the word of God. And that's not that we, we sit and we divide up our hours and say, well, if I've got five hours of meetings then I need to spend six hours in the word. No, no, no. Because honestly, our time in the word should, should, should be without separation. That's why Paul in Colossians 3.16 said to allow the word of God to dwell richly in you. And then he began to talk about what it looks like for the word of God to dwell richly in you. He talked about how they talked and how they spoke and even how they sang and how they, how they carried themselves with each other. In Colossians 4, he said that the fruit of spending time in the word and the word spending time in us is that when he would open a door that we would make manifest what we ought to say, that our speech would be with grace and salt so we know how to answer everyone. I like what James Ryle used to say. He said, get in the word until the word gets in you. Amen. Get in the word until the word gets in you because the word does a work on us. The word of God reads us oftentimes more than we read it. It helps us see us. It helps us see where we are. Amen. D.L. Moody said, he said, the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. And it's your choice. It's an act of your will. Charles Spurgeon said, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who's not. Amen. I make a habit. Typically, I've, I've got to get a new, I've got a, a, a backup of Bibles right now because I burn through them in anywhere from, from three to six months, just depending on, you know, just kind of, you know, what's happening and, and it, 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 what I'm preaching on and stuff like that. And, 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 and so, and I like that. I, you know, I, I love, I love having, I love having, I love hanging on to them. I give some of them away. But even this morning, as I was praying into some things, even about Psalm 29, I went back and I looked at three old Bibles I had of past notes that I had. Now, those three old Bibles were all Bibles in the last two years. And it was, and the problem is they get so written up and there's so much stuff in the margin and stuff like that. But there's something, I think sometimes if I go back and I keep reading the same thing and there's no room left in the margin, sometimes I don't have the room to write new revelation. And so I love keeping fresh eyes on the word. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And I believe that there's an anointing right now for fresh eyes to begin to see things that we've not seen. How many know Paul said that we would, that, 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 that eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, but it's about to, amen? And I wanna tell you, listen, I believe before we can see it before us, we gotta see it in us. Because when we talk about revival, revival is not about a corporate gathering as much as it is a personal flame. And see, personal revival comes with personal responsibility. That's why Paul told Timothy, he said, it reminds you to stir up the gift, to fan in the flame, fan into flame, the gift that was given you with laying on of hands. You've not been given a spirit of fear. You've not been given timidity or insecurity, but power, love, and a sound mind. No one can stir your fire but you. No one can stir your fire but you. And Isaiah 64, they were, they were praying, they said, oh, that you would come down, that the mountains would melt and the, the, the ground would shake and you would do great and awesome things for which we did not look. In other words, that you would do things beyond comprehension, that you would do Ephesians 3.20, beyond what we could ask or think. When God begins to do things you weren't looking for, that means he begins to so exceed your expectation that all of a sudden you're like, wow, I thought I was praying big prayers, but turns out I wasn't. Oh, that God would come down. And see, don't, let, don't, don't, don't allow your religious mind to get in a spiritual argument. Because I mean, no, when Christ came down, God came down. The heavens were open, the veil was torn, but I wanna tell you, there are places in the earth that have not recognized the coming down of God. And because of that, they live absent of his present and his promise. 
And so just because he came and just because he is doesn't mean we're all living from that reality. And there's something about revival where it is the coming down of God. It is where he is present in every area of your life, that he's not just compartmentalized in your Sunday or your devotion or your Wednesday or in the folding of the hands, the praying of the prayer, the conversation with those couple friends. But when God comes down, everything changes. And when you look throughout history, there was moments where God came down. The day of Pentecost, when, when, he, when they heard a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, how many know that was the coming down of God? When all of a sudden there was a small prayer meeting in, 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 in Wales, and all of a sudden a girl named Flory Evans stands up and says, I love God with all my heart. God came down. On Father's Day, 1994 in Toronto, God came down. On Mother's Day in, in Brownsville, God came down because people got hungry enough to stir themselves up and they believed there was more than what they tasted. They knew that there was more on the other side of their yes. And I wanna tell you, we are standing at a door and there is more on the other side. It goes on in Isaiah 64, it says God wanted to do all of these amazing things, but he couldn't find anyone to stir themselves up. Found no one, verse seven, he's found no one to stir himself up, to take personal responsibility over his promise. I believe that not only we in a time of reviving, but I believe that God is bringing a redefinition to the word revival, because how many of you know, oftentimes when a word becomes misused, it can take on the connotation and the characteristics of those who misuse it. And there was a season in my life where I didn't, I didn't wanna hear the word revival because it had a bad taste in my mouth because it was connected with, with striving and manipulation and, 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 and self-promotion and, and just, a, you know, God's gonna and da 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 people to a person as opposed to creating a resting place for the glory of God to come down. But how many of you know, we can't, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Amen. God's desire is revival. He desires to pour out his fire in you, on you and on us. Amen. And the, in the areas, John 10 and the areas where the, where the devil comes to steal, kill and destroy, Jesus desires that we would have what? Life and life more abundantly. The word revive means to give life. So what you can do in John 10, 10, he says, the thief does not come but to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come to revive you. I have come to bring you back to life. But see, when we're brought back to life, the touch of revival in our life does not require we are revived again in three more months. We are filled with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. I love what Pastor Suzanne said this past Wednesday. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not a one-time occurrence, it's a daily event. Yes. Amen. Every day we are to be filled again. And, and, and honestly, there's, the, 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 your filling is not measured by a manifestation on you. It's, man, it's, it's actually measured by the life that comes out of you. Every time they talked about being spirit filled in the scriptures, it was always the spirit filled and spoke. It was always the filling of the spirit of life was always measured by what came out, not what came on. Because you can be filled with the fullness, but if you're not releasing the fullness, then you've got a hole somewhere. And one of the things the word does is it plugs those holes. It keeps us from losing what Christ laid down his life for. And I believe that what God is, is, is doing in this house and desiring to do through this city and this region and this state and this nation and the nations of the earth is he's, he's desiring that his church would return to the word. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And I'm telling you, there is a rock of the word that you can stand on to where we don't just hear the word and build on sand, but we hear the word and we do the word. And as we're positioning our hearts, not just for God, what God wants to do among us, but for what God wants to do 
in us, I want to tell you right now that the best investment of your time is to spend time in this word. Not from a religious search, not from a striving, but from a coming with the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I do not want to read this book apart from you, but you are the author. And so I'm gonna invite you to come as my teacher. Holy Spirit, show me what to read. I ask that you would cause this word to come alive in my heart before my eyes. And that the word that I read here would come alive here so that I can manifest it there. You see, the word is still supposed to become flesh. The word is still supposed to become flesh. David prayed in Psalm 119, verse 18 in the Passion Translation, open my eyes to see the miracle wonders hidden in your word. That is a great prayer to pray when you open your Bible each day. The New King James there says, open my eyes that I would behold wonderful things from your law. Wonderful, miracle working wonders in your word. Proverbs chapter four says to guard your heart with all diligence because what? Out of it flows the springs or the issues of life. But that was why he said, do not forsake the word because it'll be life to those who find it and it'll be health to your flesh, amen. Joshua, when he was told to lead the Israelites into the land of Jericho, as the baton was being handed from Moses to Joshua, four times he said, be strong and be very courageous. And then he told him how to do it. Do not let this book depart from your mouth. Meditate in it day and night. Because if you keep it before your eyes, it will be in your heart. And if it's in your heart, it'll come out of your mouth. The word revive means to make alive. It means to give promise to. It means to live again, to nourish, to preserve, to quicken, to recover, to repair, to restore, to make whole. In Romans chapter four, verse 17, Paul is describing Abraham as the father of our faith. And, he sa- and, and it says that he being like God gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So I wanna tell you, God is a God who gives life to the dead, but once you've been given life, you then become a steward of the life that is given to begin to lay down that life so that others might find life as well. Amen. God is wanting to revive the dead places, the dry places, the cold places in you and in me. Revival is birthed when we get our eyes off of us and onto God. Revival dies when we get our eyes off of God and onto us. Think about what happened in the garden. There were two trees in the garden, right? Well, actually there was many trees, but there's two trees we often talk about, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Where was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? It was in the center. And when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, their eyes got off of God and onto them and they became preoccupied with what they lacked. They became insecure in their own understanding. And see, your own, under, your, your own understanding will always create insecurity in your life. But what's interesting was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was not just that if they ate it, they would die. It was the fruit was poison. And I wanna tell you, getting our eyes off of him and onto us will never produce his fruit in our life. You cannot be fruitful and multiply his image while beholding yours. And the thing about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was when they tasted it, Eve, Eve, Eve and then Adam, they, they began to not only, not only see in a different way, but they began to doubt the word of God in their life. And what happens is we begin to find ourselves eating from the wrong tree. We then begin to take on the likeness of the tree by which we eat. And it was self-centered. They saw themselves and they no longer saw him. And nothing will pull you out of a move of God quicker than getting your eyes on you and off of him. How many of you know that? And so the thing about the, the, thing about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was there, 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 had to be, um, there had to be an opportunity. People say, well, why would, they, why would they put the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil both there? You know, if, if God knew what it, would, what it could do to him, then why did he even put it in the garden? Because if there's not a freedom to disobey, there's never really obedience. If you can't, listen, it's not real worship unless you have a choice not to worship. That's why if you make everybody stand and they raise their hands, you don't really know who the real worshipers are in the house. Now I recognize that sometimes people are just like, is this, are we good? Are we a hand raising church? What's going on here? 
Sometimes people will what are the rules of engagement? Are we, uh, you know? And then they see Jason hit the stage like, oh, we that, we that kind of church. All right, okay, good. All of a sudden, then they know cartwheels are game, amen? But I want to tell you, listen, if you have to tell people what to do and when to do all the time, guess what? It's not coming from them. It's being expected of them. And God desires to reveal himself to us through his word in a way that the life we live in God comes from surrender and it comes from an act of our will according to his word. And it's us every day waking up and saying, God, I choose you over self. I choose you over self. And one of the things when you see in Psalm 119 is there are five prayers that David prayed that were, I believe, the fruit of daily choosing God over self. And the first prayer in Psalm 119 verse 25 was revive me according to your word. Bring me back to life according to your word. Now that word, the Hebrew word for word there is dabar, dabar. Does anybody remember any time in scripture where, where, where there was a place called dabar? Maybe Lodabar. There is, how many of you are familiar with Lodabar and Mephibosheth? Nobody? You gotta be careful when you say it, you might cuss. Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son. And, 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 and so what happened was when David, so when, so when word came back, you know, that Jonathan and Saul had been killed and that David was becoming king, Mephibosheth had a person, a caretaker who was assigned to care for him while his father was off in battle. And when word came back that Jonathan was dead and Saul was done, all of a sudden it says that she feared for her life. She picked him up. She loved Mephibosheth like her own. Now his name, Mephibosheth, meant dispeller of shame. Dispeller of shame. And she picks him up and she begins to run out of fear. And when fear becomes the motivating force in your life, people around you always get hurt. And as she began to run in fear for her life, she ran and it said that she dropped him and he became lame in both of his feet. And what happened was because he became crippled in his call, they put him in a place called Lodabar. And that was where, where, where kind of the beggars lived. That was kind of people, people who, who, who were not able to tend and fend for themselves. They put them there and they would just send occasional rations. But see, Lodabar meant no word. Lodabar is a place that was no word, no revelation. It, it also means a dry place. And what happens, one of the things that can cut us off from the life that is found in the word of God is when we get our eyes off of God and onto us. And the quickest way to do that is by focusing on what people do to you instead of what God has done for you. And when Mephibosheth, he, you know, he would, so many times he would just sit there crippled and, and, and remembering what life was like before he fell, before he got hurt, before he became crippled. But guess what? The more he thought about what happened to him, the drier he became until a king sent for him and called him out of Lodabar and invited him to sit at the king's table. And David, David was a good king. He remembered he had a covenant with Jonathan. How do you know we have a covenant? And he remembered the covenant. And he asked one of his servants named Ziba. He said, Ziba, is there anybody left of the household of Jonathan? Because I had this covenant with Jonathan that, that, that I would show kindness, loving kindness to his house. And that was another prayer that David prayed in Psalm 119. Revive us according to your loving kindness. Five prayers of revival in Psalm 119. Revive me according to your word. Revive us according to your righteousness. Revive us according to your ways. Revive us according to your loving kindness. Revive us according to your justice. Four were about us, one was about me, word. Because your relationship with the word is your responsibility. And when we live in that place of the word, not just being alive in us, but us being alive in the word, guess what? We position ourselves for a revival of his ways because we know him. We position ourselves for a revival of his righteousness because we know that we've been made right in his sight through Jesus Christ. 
We position ourselves for a revival of his loving kindness because we know it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And it's his touch of mercy and it's such a favor in our life that makes us who we are. It positions us for a revival of justice to see not just the widows and the orphans cared for, but to recognize that anywhere and everywhere there's an absence of heaven and the earth, we've been given responsibility to step up and make a difference. But it all comes from being revived, made alive, according to his word. According to his word. And one of the things that you'll do is as you begin to spend more time in his word, all of a sudden, people's opinions and preference will have less of a hold on your heart. And in the areas where your thinking has been contrary to his truth, you'll find your thoughts subject to his word instead of his word being subject to your thoughts. Sometimes we're spending more time with our thoughts than we are his word, and that will lead to destruction. How many of you know that? In fact, how many of you have been in a place where your thoughts have been running 100 miles an hour and you've just been trying to tread water mentally and emotionally? There has been a little swirl in the spirit. Hallelujah. But here's, what, here's the thing is, you can't allow the swirl in the spirit around you to affect the truth that is in you. And listen, I know in my life, when all hell feels like it's breaking loose around me, I know that there's an immovable force in me. It's a seed that is, that is not subject to death and decay. It is a seed that is not subject to destruction. It is the word of God. And by it, I've been born again. I have a divine nature. Because of this word, I don't live by my feelings. I live by my beliefs. And I thank God for my feelings when they're shaped by my beliefs instead of my beliefs being shaped by my feelings. You see, because when your feelings are shaped by your belief, what you know affects what, where you go. But when your feelings shape your belief, what you don't know determines where you go and the decisions you make. How many of you know that? And so there's a call, there's an invitation, I believe. I believe it's always there, but I believe right now that there's a wooing of the Lord, just like in Hosea 6, when, when Hosea said, come, let us return to the Lord. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. Come, let us return to the Lord. Come, let us return to his word. Every revival, when you look throughout history, it began with a hunger for God that was born out of the word of God and then was met with the prayers of people who chose to invest themselves spiritually in the promise that God had given them found in their word. When people found a, a promise in scripture that was greater than what they had seen in their own life and they began to believe what was in this more than what was around them, and they would press in and they would pray and they would believe until they saw with their eyes what they believe with their heart. And I believe I'm standing before a people like that now who have been so gripped by the word as we grip the word in our own life that we're not willing to, to let go of promises or to shrink back to normal life, but to recognize we've been given a supernatural call to see Jesus lifted high in this land. And the more we know him through the word, the more we can be like him in the world around us. So what is revival? Yes, the definition is to be, to be made alive, to be, to be resurrected, to be repaired, to be redeemed, to be rebuilt, to be restored. But I like to say this, revival is not an event. It's not an occurrence. It's not something coming. It is who we are when we get a revelation of who he is. And I wanna tell you, this word reveals who he is. The spirit begins to breathe on it and make it come alive. Listen, I wanna tell you, you're not called to read this book apart from the spirit, but I also wanna tell you, following the spirit apart from the word doesn't work either. In fact, I've seen a lot of people who started off in the spirit and ended up in error when they didn't have an anchor of the word. And they said, the spirit made me do it. I said, he did not anoint you to be weird. 
Holy Spirit gets blamed for some stuff, doesn't he? I'm going to leave it there. (laughs) Folks, I'm telling you, this word is life to those who find it. It's health to their flesh. It's life to those who find it. It's health to their flesh. I want to read one more scripture to you. And I want to pray. I want to pray that God would revive us according to his word that we would not find ourselves like Mephibosheth in a dry place, a place of no word because of what someone may or may not done to you. Because guess what I wanna tell you? Your, your destiny in God cannot be dependent on anyone but Christ Jesus. Cannot be dependent on your spouse. Well, God, if she was only this, I would do that. It doesn't work that way. Cannot be dependent on your employer. Can be dependent on your kids. Cannot be dependent on your pastor. I'm gonna help you the best I can. I'm gonna lead you, I'm gonna guide you, I'm gonna feed you. But guess what? Your revival is not my responsibility. My responsibility is to hold up the standard of who we're called to be. And as many as are willing to run with that standard, they're the ones that are gonna burn bright. Amen? And as we all take ownership for the incredible opportunity we've been given, we will not only find life, but we will obtain favor from the Lord. Favor from the Lord from the Lord. Proverbs chapter eight, verse 34 and 35. I wasn't planning to talk about this, but I just keep seeing this. Proverbs eight, 34 and 35. It says, Forever, whoever finds me, this is wisdom speaking. Whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. That's verse 35. Verse 34, blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. And so it's, it's a posture of daily pursuit. Turn to Isaiah 55 real quick. I know I said one scripture, but hallelujah. This is the last, last Sunday we're having two services, so I'm gonna go for it, hallelujah. One more scripture. Which by the way, too, with us going to, to, to one service, I'm gonna, tell, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna finish explaining a little bit of why we're doing that. But I wanna tell you, it's not just about coming together in one place. It really is a strategic move to position us for the more of God and for not just an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But one of the things is, is how many of you know that God is not limited by time and space, but oftentimes we find, we, we find a desire in our heart plus a responsibility around us to make sure that all of the family is feasting from the same table, that we're all heading in the same direction, Amen. And one of the things I know that as Pastor Jeff and myself and, our, and, and Pastor Jody and Jonathan and, 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 and our whole pastoral team, as we talk about you know, how to best lead our body, our desire is always to be able to have both services, the nine o'clock and the 11 o'clock, eating from the same table, headed in the same direction. And if we had a canned sermon and canned worship, you could do that. If we were just recycling the nine at the 11, you could do that. But there's something else in us that you cannot put in a can. It's something that we believe that, is, that, that all of creation is groaning for to where we can follow the spirit in step, not, not an hour behind or an hour ahead, but second by second, looking to the spirit of God to lead us and to direct us. In Isaiah 55, he says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what is not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Come, here and your soul shall live. And this is the word speaking to us. In the same way in John 1, it says that he came as the word. In the beginning was the word. He came as the word and he became flesh and dwelt among us. I wanna tell you, he is still revealing himself through the word. How many of you know that? And the more we give place in our life to his word, the more we become like him and the more the Holy Spirit has to draw from in our life, releasing his life. How do you know that? In Acts chapter one, it says, not only did they enter in and come up to that upper room, but it said they were together in one accord. They were all coming around the same promise in the same place. 
Acts chapter two, it said, when the day of Pentecost had fully gone, come, they were together in one place at one time with one heart, one mind, one accord. And, and in, this, in this place of being in, in one place, they, they just believed that there is something about being better together because I wanna tell you, the spirit did not fall on the 120 individually. It fell on the coming together. And Isaiah 65, eight says that new wine is found in the cluster. There's something about bringing your grape to his vine and getting close to people to your left and to your right. That we pursue his call over our comfort because when you think about a picture of grapes, you don't have, you don't have a grape here and a grape there. You've got a group of grapes that are intimately connected together and rightly connected to the vine and that is who this body is called to be. God has prepared a new wine skin for a new wine. And we were going to Starbucks this morning on our way here and, and, and Joshua and Caleb went in to get their, their weekly little Starbucks deal. And I saw something on the door that spoke to me that I want to close with here. This is the front of the door at Starbucks. It says, the blend is the magic. We're at our best when we're together. And don't let your religious spirit get ruffled because it had magic. But, which by the way, do you know there's such a thing as an anti-religious religious spirit? And sometimes in an effort to not be religious, we become rebellious. But that's a whole nother sermon. I feel the anointing on it though. I'm just gonna, let, I'm just gonna park over here. Tim's gonna keep an eye on it. And we're going to come back to that. <laughs> say this, say we're at our best when we're together. You see, if your destiny, listen, I want to tell you, every God-given vision, every God-given destiny, there is a responsibility between you and God, but it is intimately connected to your left and to your right. There are people that God has appointed to your life that without that person's agreement, you cannot walk out what God has called to you, called you to. But I love this. My attention was the blend. And the blend to me, it, it was not the same as the magic, the blend. And one of the things that I believe that God has, and it, just look around, look at, look at this beautifully blended body. Look around. Does anybody look like you? I hope not. You're beautiful, but we got you. So now there needs to be people who don't look like you. The blend. Listen, I want to tell you, unity and diversity is a recipe for reformation. And there's something about being able to come together. And this is part of what I feel like God has positioned us for, even with this, this coming together, not just in one service, but you know, the community, some of the community events that we have coming up and things that are going to, it is, we're asking the Lord to bring the beauty of the blend forth in a way to where like Pastor Jonathan said, not only do we recognize our God-given gifts, but those around us can begin to celebrate the gifts that God has given and one of the ways you see your gift activated is by stirring it up, fanning into flame, activating his word and seeing him revive you according to his likeness. Amen? I wanna pray for you. Go ahead and stand to your feet. God, I thank you for this beautiful blend. <laughs> this beautiful blend. God, I thank you that your body is you, every, the, each member in your body is uniquely different from one another. And that is by design. That is by divine design. Lord, right now, I, I thank you, God, for where you've had us. But Lord, right now, God, I just, I ask for a grace of hunger in us to return to the word to return to the word, to not fall victim to that, that, that voice that says, well, you know that, you don't need to read that. No, I wanna tell you, if you'll read what you think you know with fresh eyes, you'll see something you never saw. It's a living word. It's sharp. Woo, baby, it's sharp. It'll cut you. It'll divide between soul and spirit. It'll help you to see what's God, what's you, and what's the devil. And in that, you can say, I wanna be with God. And in that, you'll be transformed into his likeness. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the beauty of this body. I thank you for how you're leading us. I thank you for where we've been. I thank you for where we are. And I thank you for where we're going. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, for wisdom and revelation to touch the eyes of every heart and for an insatiable hunger for your word to capture us in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today and you do not know him, you may have heard about him, but you've never experienced his abundant life for yourself. I wanna pray for you real quick. If you're here and you don't know him or you're walking in your own way and you wanna surrender your life to him this day, 
on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand where you are. And we're just gonna pray together. We're gonna have ministry teams in the back that are gonna be able to continue to minister to you. But I don't want you to leave here the way you came here if there's things that you need to leave behind. If that's you on the count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three. If you're here and you don't know him or you're here and you don't wanna leave here the way you came. You know what this tells me? It tells me that we have his life. Now we need to go some, find some people who don't. We need to be like those four friends that brought their crippled friend to Jesus. Never allow what somebody did to you to define your relationship with what he's done for you. I love you. I bless you. We're gonna have ministry teams on this back wall to my right. If you have kids and King's kids, please go ahead and go pick them up. Bless the teachers. This, uh, this Wednesday, Pastor Jody is gonna be speaking uh, for our worship and equipping service. It's gonna be an incredible time. And don't forget next Sunday, one service at 10 a.m. We're bringing in all the chairs. Hey, take that new driveway for a test drive. It's awesome. Thank you so much for taking your time to join with us for one of our most recent services here at Kingsway Church. Again, we pray that you enjoyed your time viewing this video and we invite you, if you're watching this on YouTube, click the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on newly uploaded content. If you're watching this on one of our social media platforms, we encourage you to like and share this video with your friends. And if you're watching on our website, kingswayal.com, we ask that you send us an email at info at kingswayal.com. Let us know where you're watching from and how this service impacted you. We bless you.